loosely translates to the search for truth. It is actively focused on developing research skills, polishing speaking style, and thinking on your feet. Many famous people like Oprah Winfrey, Bruce Springsteen, Malcolm X, and 60% of US senators and representatives have been part of speech and debate. During this event, we want to remind you guys that you are completely welcome to keep your cameras on, but please mute your microphones. If you have any type of question or comment, please put it in the chat. Uh, to start today off, we'd like to introduce Ken Catlin. He will be a doing extemporaneous speech, which is a limited prep speech where the speaker has 30 minutes from the time they receive their topic to the time that they present. So performing is Ken, and we'll see him in 30 minutes. All right, so the first speech that we're gonna be seeing today is called Dramatic Interpretation. Dramatic Interpretation uses the speaker's emotions to convey a message and the speaker to, can portray one or more characters to do so. When the book is open, the speaker will be reading from the text. When it is closed, they are using their own voice and argument for the piece. Doing dramatic interpretation is Carly Jarvis. She's a first semester team member who competes in dramatic inter, but is adding more next semester. She is a comms major and Carly, welcome to the floor. I just don't know what to wear, Sarah. Um, you think maybe I should wear this blue one? Okay, how about, ooh, what about this black one? Okay, I guess maybe neither of them. Next week is Serena and I's big night out. It's gonna be our one year anniversary, so we're doing the whole fancy thing. Dinner, a movie, a few drinks, okay maybe a lot of drinks. Just been a long time since we've been able to do anything remotely romantic. All right, this is the one. Hmm, oh, what shoes should I wear? It's weird, kind of late for a knock. Kayla, wait, Serena, what's, what's going on? Here, let's bring her inside, quick. Is, is she okay, Kayla? What the hell happened? Look at me. Look at me, honey. I can't I can't help you if you don't tell me what's going on. Hold hold on, Kayla. Love, look at me. I I just don't know what to do. Um, I think I'm just gonna call 911, Kayla. In 2018, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention reported that there were 48,344 suicidal deaths. This is a 35% increase since 1999. When hearing a statistic like this, someone might ask, why didn't they reach out? But what about those that did and the help just couldn't catch them in time? Mental illness weighs heavy on relationships and personally for me, have been the cause of some not making it. During these times of seclusion, Acknowledging the effects mental illness has on us all is even more crucial. During their series of short plays and monologues, Zachary Burton and Elijah Hoffmeister recognized the value of a spectrum of voices needed to fight stigma, as was done with the vagina monologues. They seek to do the same in their series focused on mental illness. The manic monologues, Kelly Sicario's story, because dating is hard enough without having to disclose that I have a mental illness. That was a really tough day. That was the day that I found out just how much Serena was struggling. And it turns out she's actually bipolar. And with bipolar disorder comes anxiety and depression. So yeah, I think that was the hardest day that I had ever had. When we first met, it was just a casual thing. We had some friends in common, so birthdays had us running into each other, and we started talking and then started hanging out, just the two of us. I think the thing that really drew me to her was her drive. She works so hard, and what's even better, she actually loves the work she does. 
<laughs> even if I, I don't understand any of it. She gets so into explaining all of her labs, what this means and what that means, and how her work is really going to do something. You know, not just research for the sake of research. Okay. So I know what you're thinking. Didn't I know? Didn't I see the signs? Well, maybe I did. Maybe I did see the signs and I, I just didn't know what they meant. She was working so hard that week before that first night. I just, I thought she was busy. So I let her have her space. But that night when Kayla brought her over, I had never seen anybody look like that before. Her eyes were so empty. It was clear she had been crying. I just, I didn't know why. I remember that night so vividly. It's like a dream you keep replaying in your mind, trying to make sense of it, but you just can't. It was about 8 p.m. when I heard the pounding on the front door. My heart dropped as I tried and I pleaded with Serena, love, I can't help you if you don't tell me what's going on. I had never seen anybody like that before. I felt helpless. I felt out of control. I didn't, I didn't know how to support her, how to fix her. But she couldn't tell me what was wrong. And now I realize that maybe, maybe it's because she didn't know herself. Apparently earlier that night, she had a psychotic break. She was working at home on her project, but the numbers just weren't adding up. So she'd restart over and over again, just to get the same wrong results. At some point, she just left her house and started walking. I don't know for how long, but at some point, she came upon a parking garage. She climbed those stairs to that top level, standing there, looking down from so high up. I mean, how long did she stand up there for? What was she thinking? At some point, Kayla found her wandering in the middle of their street, completely disoriented, and brought her right to my house. And you know, even after all of that, she still won't tell me what was wrong. She said it was a blip and that it wasn't a big deal. But I know, I know it was a big deal. I saw her face that night. I looked into those eyes. It was a big deal. This still is a big deal. And now, after all of the doctors and all of the tests, we know what's wrong. Well, I mean, we do, but we don't. We don't know when it will happen again or if it will happen again. And it's not helping. She still won't talk to me. It's, it's just, you know, I didn't sign up for this shit. I didn't know it could go this way. It's just, it's just all too fucking much. I know, I know, Sarah, I should play the supportive partner, but what if I can't? What if, what if she needs me? And I can't do it. And I, I just messed all up. <sighs> it's, it's hard to be there for someone in their moment of weakness. I mean, what really is the right thing to do. 
We're all just doing the best we can. Tonight is date night, and and I I just want to forget about all of this for one night. We'll hold hands walking to dinner. We'll smile and laugh, and we'll enjoy these good moments. I think I can do that. Yeah, I can do this. Oh, and by the way, I went with the red dress. Next, I'd like to introduce Vanessa Flournoy, a first semester speech and debate team member. She will be participating in Persuasive, which is a 10 minute speech where the speaker will try to convince us of their opinion. Next semester, she will add more to her plate when she joins our team yet again. Vanessa. On March 12, 1990, over a thousand protesters gathered at the U.S. Capitol building. At the foot of the steps lay crutches, empty wheelchairs, and other assistive devices as their owners prepared to assemble 100 steps. Jennifer Keelan, a second grader of the Sever Posse, and the youngest protester crawled, pulling herself by her arms and hands, demanding equality, saying, I will take all night if I have to. Protesters like her led to the Americans with Disabilities Act, which so many use to this day. The ADA issued in a new age of education for people with disabilities, special education. But as political writer Nicole Gordino pointed out in September of this year, special ed isn't all that special anymore. And that's because roughly 20% of our student populations are part of it. While it's wonderful that we're tracking these numbers more accurately to include a range of learning differences, we're still setting a separate and much lower bar for the achievement for this group. Students with disabilities are not expected to go on to college, and in its current form, the education system is actively preventing them from doing this. We all understand the importance of higher education. That's why we're here. So then why is it taken away from approximately 10 million people in our country? Today, we will track down the problem, uncover some of the causes, before finally taking note of some very real solutions. Because for students like me who were told early on that college wasn't a viable option, I'm here to tell you just how wrong that assumption is. The problem's rather simple. Not enough students with disabilities are going on to college, and that's proving detrimental to their future. First, it's important to know that differently abled students are not a boutique issue. The CDC reports in 2019 that 17% of students ages 3 to 17 have a learning disability, and this includes a range of diagnoses from autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit disorder, vision, hearing loss, and more. But this group, an alarming number, choose not to go on to college. The University of New Hampshire's Institute on Disabilities Annual Report on Disability Statistics and Demographics in 2019 found that 84% of students with disabilities obtain a high school diploma, but only 15% obtain a bachelor's degree or higher. The Bureau of Labor and Statistics in 2019 found that the average pay increase from a high school diploma to an AA degree is roughly $600 a month. With a bachelor's degree, that difference is nearly $2,000 a month. While it'd be great to live in a world where this doesn't matter, it does. A person's financial security is directly related to their health and well-being. Michael Mitzer, a senior contributor on education at Forbes, states that high school students with intellectual and developmental disabilities dream of going on to college. Those dreams are dashed against the harsh realities. Colleges are not ready for them, and people don't believe they can function. Now that we see how the problem impacts this specific group, let's examine what has caused it to be so overlooked. First with the antiquated educational guide, and then the trail of inequity leading to it. Educators, parents, and students look to the Department of Education to guide them through the rocky transition from high school to college. Students with disabilities have more needs, and yet the only resource to be found is a 2007 guide that was reprinted in 2011, Transition of Students with Disabilities to Post-Secondary Education, a Guide for High School Educators. The title alone sounds like this ought to be a tool for special education teachers. Unfortunately, that would be very misleading. After a brief history of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 
and the IDEA Act, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, it goes through some frequently asked questions. It becomes clear very quickly that a student will be responsible for what must be done to obtain accommodations at colleges or universities. It states students are expected to advocate for themselves. Rather than address this concern and look for possible remedies, it informs educators and students that a student must accept responsibility and adapt. It's clear this isn't a guide. It's a warning to students with disabilities. The Department of Education doesn't have to back. Unfortunately, students and their families have heard this message loud and clear. Understood, a national organization leading the way on education and advancement for people with disabilities conducted a survey in 2016 asking over 1,200 parents of high school students with disabilities their experience with the college system. Only 11% of parents with high school students seeking a college accommodations clearly understood the process. Three-fourths of parents found it difficult to find any information on the disability services provided. This is in stark contrast to the assistance provided through the IDEA Act, which demands all government-funded high schools provide an IEP, Individualized Education Program. These IEPs pinpoint the disability the student struggles with and the path created by educators, parents, and if necessary, specialists. While this is great for students K through 12, it doesn't continue beyond that. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 does not require higher institutions of learning to adhere to IEPs. Because of this, only half of government-funded colleges allow IEPs as proof of disability. Therefore, students are forced to find new and often confusing ways to prove their disability. Due to the high cost of services, many only see treatment through the education system, guaranteed by their IEP, which is then rendered useless upon entering college. Again, telling students with disabilities they're not welcome and they won't be supported if they try. Now that we understand more of the causes, let's tap into the solutions, some of which are already in the works and some we can help push into action. Everything begins and ends in the Department of Education. They guide the way on how high schools, colleges, and universities handle issues like students with disabilities. Since the inception of the Americans with Disabilities Act, we've come a long way. It's time we take the next step. Senator Robert P. Casey Jr. of Pennsylvania has introduced the RIDE Act, Respond, Innovate, Succeed, and Empower Act, which aims to amend the Higher Education Act of 1965. This would provide students and their families access to critical information needed to select the right institution and succeed once enrolled. It also would train educators on the accommodations necessary for students with disabilities. I ask you in supporting me with the RISE Act, Contact your local representative and let them know you want their support for this bill. I'll be including a link with some additional information and instructions in the chat later. The National Center for Learning Disabilities ardently supports the RISE Act, while also advocating for changes not yet addressed. They've worked together with educators, parents, students, and specialists to come up with actionable solutions. And many come down to the need for the higher education institutions to reach out creating a bridge between the accommodations and the students that need them. Still, the process for transition begins in high school, usually in the last year when students are most focused on their future. Teachers, counselors, and others get involved in helping the students select the right institutions to apply to. Logically, this is the best place to introduce disability services and programs. To all students, not just those with known disabilities, some learning disabilities fly under the radar. And when a student learns their problem can be helped, that makes their chance at success that much higher. For students already enrolled in a special education program, the IEP is the perfect place to begin the transition process. This is the best time for educators, parents, students, and specialists to start looking at what's available during those already scheduled meetings. Locally, Colleges and universities can have their disability services programs reach out to the local high school. The football team isn't the only thing to be proud about. Helpful programs and services should be celebrated, not hidden away. Today, we took the winding transition through the education system and how it's failing to help students with disabilities secure a better future through education after high school. First, with the problems so many are facing. Second, with our broken and outdated procedures before finally taking note of some very real solutions. 
30 years ago, Jennifer Keeling crawled her way to the top of the Capitol steps. Many students with disabilities are still clawing their way to the top, and you have the ability to help. For most students, going on to college is the natural and expected next step. But for some, it's a fight. Thank you. All righty, great job, Vanessa. Next up will be prose interpretation. Similar to dramatic interpretation, prose interpretation is an open book, closed book format. When the book is open, they'll be reading from a text, and when it is closed, they will be uh, voicing their own thoughts. Just to let you know, this will be a dramatic prose with some violent themes. Giving this speech is going to be Mary Grace. She is a first uh, semester team member who competes in prose and program oral interpretation, and she is a psychology major. Mary Grace. If you are reading this story out now, please recognize the following voices. Me, as a child, high-pitched, forgettable. As a woman, the same. I'm at the neighbor's party with my parents and I am 17, though my father didn't notice I drink half a glass of white wine in the kitchen with the neighbor's teenage daughter. And now everything is soft, like a fresh oil painting. The boy doesn't notice me. I see the muscles of his neck and upper back. We stand out in buttoned down shirts. I stand for a bit. I have always wanted to choose my moment. And in this moment, I choose. On the deck, I kiss him, he kisses me back, gently at first, but then harder. When he pulls away, his eyes dart around for a minute before landing on my neck. What's that, he asks. Oh, this, it's just my ribbon. He reaches his hand out and I seize it and push it away. Don't touch it. You can't touch it. I thought he heard me. In the early 1920s, psychologist Sigmund Freud coined the phrase penis envy. According to Freud, all women have penis envy, the intense desire to own a male genitalia. And the only way to get rid of this desire was by having a child, specifically a male. Karen Horney went on to challenge Freud's beliefs by stating, women did not wish to possess a penis just to have the same rights and recognition that go along with it. She later developed her own theory of womb envy, highlighting women's power to bring life into this earth and men's innate response of wanting to steal that power back. Never is this more apparent than in the secretive, unethical practice of the husband stitch which, according to Healthline, is an extra set of stitches given during the repair process after a vaginal birth, supposedly to tighten the vagina for an increased pleasure in a male sexual partner. This extra stitch can lead to excruciating pain, deadly infections, and even infertility. So through pros, so through pros Husband Stitch by Carmen Maria Macardo, let's bring light to this horrific event and call it what it truly is another arcade attempt for men to control and sexualize women's bodies. Before we go inside, he asks if he can see me again. I tell him that I would like that. A few days later, he takes me in his car in the dark to a lake with a marshy edge. I'm not truly sure what he's doing before he does it. His body locks onto mine and he is pushing and pushing and I don't know what to do. It hurts. I imagine it can feel good. Once he's done, he turns and looks at me. Tell me about your ribbon. No, it's my ribbon. Don't, you can't touch it. Take me home. And like a gentleman, he does. If you are reading this story out loud, make the sound of a bed under the tension of train travel by straining a metal folding chair against its hinges. When he asks me to marry him, day shy of my 18th birthday, I say yes, yes, please. My parents are pleased about the marriage. My mother says that girls nowadays are starting to marry late. My cycle soon stops after we return from our honeymoon trip. I tell my husband one night, he glows with delight. A child, he says. He lies back with his hands beneath his head. A child. He is quiet for so long 
but I think he had fallen asleep. But he rolls over on his side and gazes at me. Will the child have a ribbon? I feel my jaw tight and my mind skips between many answers and I settle on the one that brings me the least amount of anger. I, I don't know. He startles me then by putting his hands around my throat. I put my hands up to stop him, but he uses his strength, holding my wrist with one hand. He touches my ribbon with the other. Please, I say, but he doesn't seem to hear. Please, I say louder, but my voice cracking in the middle. He could have undone it then. He could have untied my ribbon if he wanted to. But he releases me and rolls back on his back. I need to get a drink of water. I get up and go to the bathroom. I frantically run the tap, tears caught between my lashes. The ribbon is still tight. I am in labor for 20 hours. I nearly wrenched off my husband's hands, howling obscenities that do not seem to shock the nurse. I am certain I will crush my own teeth into powder. The doctor peers down between my legs, his white eyebrows moving together. What's happening? Mm, if there's no movement soon, we're gonna have to do it. Might be best for everyone. He looks up, I'm almost certain I see him wink at my husband, but the pain makes the mind see things differently than they really are. I make a deal with little one. I think, little one, this is the last time it's going to be just you and me. Please don't make them cut you out of me. Agony grabs me by my hair and pulls me down a long, dark tunnel. I start to lose focus, looking in and out of consciousness. I feel a cut, but not across my stomach as I had feared. The doctor cuts down, and I feel a little tugging, though perhaps it's just what they've given me. If you are reading this story out loud, Give a paring knife to the listener and ask them to cut the tender flap of skin between your thumb and index finger. I feel a little bit of tugging, though perhaps it's what they've given me. Afterwards, thank them. No ribbon, a boy. I begin to weep and curl the unmarked baby to my chest. They take my baby, so they may fix me where they cut. They give me something that makes me sleepy, delivered gently through delivered through a mask pressed gently between my mouth and nose. My husband jokes around with the doctor as he holds my hand. How much for that extra stitch? You offer that, right? Please, I say, but it comes out no more than a small moan. <laughs> you aren't the first. I slide down a long, dark tunnel and then surface again covered in vomit. The rumor is it's something like, like a virgin. The doctor walks towards the door, wiping his hands on a cloth. You're all sewn up, don't you worry, nice and tight. Everyone's happy. The nurse will speak to you about your recovery. You're going to need to rest for a while. He leaves, and I reach for my baby. But the pain, it hurts. So I wait. My son is a good baby. He grows and grows. We never have another child. So not for the lack of trying. I suspect that little one did so much ruinous damage inside of me that my body just couldn't house another. <laughs> you were a poor tenant, little one. Sometimes my son brushes up against my ribbon, but I'm not afraid. He sees it as a part of me. At least that's how it was for many years. Then, sometime later in his teens, he began to change. His voice deepened. He moved with purpose. He started to wear button down shirts that made him stand out. One day, he touches my throat and asks about my ribbon. He tries to pull at it. And though it pains me, I have to forbid him from doing it. Something is lost between us. Something that I will never get again. If you are reading this story out loud, move aside to the curtain to illustrate your final point. It will be raining, I promise.
All right, I'd like to welcome back Ken. Uh, Ken is a political science major and is going on his third semester on our team. Uh, for the past 30 minutes, Ken has been researching the topic we gave him at the beginning of the, the event. So, Ken, if you will. The year 2020 has been full of twists and turns, surprises, pleasant and unpleasant. And of course, politics is no exception. You see, 2020 was supposed to be the year of the blue wave, where Democrats were supposed to take back the House, flip the Senate, and expand their lead in the House of Representatives. Joe Biden won the White House, as we all know. Democrats have so far failed to flip the Senate, but surprisingly, Democrats have narrowed, have lost seats in the House, and narrowed their lead to the smallest point in recent memory. Pundits and political observers predict the blue wave based on social movements like the George Floyd protest, Medicare, uh, Medicare for All, and the Green New Deal, and Democratic voters inflamed by Trump's rhetoric. Unfortunately, we haven't seen what they predicted. So the question we'll be answering today is, why did this happen? Why did the GOP gain the seven seats that they gained in the House of Representatives? The answer to this is threefold. One, Trump motivated a massive base of voters. Two, Democratic infighting and progressive policies scared away moderate voters. And third, finally, and most importantly, the social backlash of conservatives against liberal policies. So getting right into it, Trump motivated a massive base of voters. Now, uh, at this point, it seems contradictory given that Joe Biden won the White House. In short, he did by twice what Hillary Clinton won the popular vote over Trump by in 2016. But Trump still managed to mobilize 74 million American voters. To put that in perspective, there are only two candidates in American history who have managed to do more than that, and that was Barack Obama and now President elect Joe Biden. Trump still ran one of the most popular political candidates in American history, and we're seeing that play out in Congress. So why does Trump, or why does Trump's voters matter for Congress? Well, as, as Recline describes in his book, Why We're Polarized, American voters have increasingly since the 1970s voted party and down ballots. Any candidate that voter supports uh, for their party for president, they're also likely to vote for Congress in their local and state representatives. A Republican will vote for Republican presidents and representatives. A Democrat will vote for president, Democratic presidents and Democratic representatives. So anyone turning out for Trump also turns out for uh, Trump's affiliates in Congress and in their local offices. So we can see how polarization is, is uh, again, congressional leader. Now, you might say, well, Joe Biden got more votes, so why doesn't that translate to more votes for Congress as well? Well, it does, but the problem is that Congress is voted based on state districts and not the American conglomerate. Democratic voters are more densely packed than Republican voters, and therefore, Republicans have a district advantage in Congress that they don't enjoy in the White House. So, understanding this, we'll move on to the second point. Democratic infighting and progressives scaring away moderate voters. Uh, there are two factions in the Demo Democratic Party currently. Uh, these can be illustrated most prominently by the Bernie Sanders faction versus the Joe Biden faction. <sighs> there's the progressives and there's the mainline liberals. Uh, NPR posted an article on November 15th highlighting that after the immediately after the election, many mainline liberals had attacked progressives like Alexander Ocasio-Cortez. Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar over their policies and scaring away voters. This has a twofold effect. One, splitting the Democratic vote over candidates, possibly giving Republicans the comparative advantage over Democrats in district elections, and two, scaring away moderate voters which might otherwise vote for the Democratic Party. Best case scenario, these voters just stay home. Worst case scenario, they go and vote for the Democrats, Democrats adversaries. Policies like the Green New Deal, Medicare for All, and uh, uh, other uh, socialist uh, labels 
have impacted uh, moderates' views of Democrats. So this has hurt their reputation in the long run. This hurts party unity and hurts voter turnout for Democrats. Thirdly, going into our last point here, and probably the biggest point of all of this, looking at the bigger picture, the social conservative backlash against the liberal social movement. Elio Hagen of The Guardian wrote in January of this year, far before the election, that this was an issue that progressives needed to gain unity with the Democrats or else they would suffer losses. She says that the anti-woke movement is real and that conservatives are organized against it. The right has finally found their voice in candidates like Donald Trump and his affiliates, and they're willing to use it to their political advantage. Scott Sumner of the Library of Economics and Liberty writes that things such as uh, radical feminism, uh, political, uh, political correctness culture, Black Lives uh, Black Lives Matter movements, socialism, gun control abortions, all of these points motivate conservative voters to get out and vote, and they divide Democratic voters. This leads to a clear advantage for conservatives, politically speaking. Uh, they are much more ideologically cohesive and are now using that cohesion for political gain. George Floyd protests were also the tipping point. The violence seen in some of the riots in the George Floyd protests, though mostly peaceful, was highlighted by the media and used to scare conservative voters to get them out to vote. All three of these factors, Trump mobilizing his, ba his base to bring out more conservative votes for the Republican Party, led to more uh, Republican votes in Congress, Democratic infighting, hurt the Democrat vote, split uh, what would be the Democratic lead. And thirdly, the now global movement anti-woke policies against the uh, liberal social policies that we've seen over the last few decades are now culminating into a unified political voice causing problems for Democrats. All these combined to turn the big blue wave into a small blue ripple. Thank you. All right. Great job, Ken. And remember, that was a limited prep speech right there. He only had 30 minutes to come up with that entire speech. But lastly for today, we're going to be doing an ADS, or an after-dinner speech. An after-dinner speech is either an informative or persuasive speech that uses humor to convey a message. Now, Deb is going to be joining us from Zoom, and Deb is a double major in poli-sci and communications and is a second semester member. So if you guys would like to turn on your cameras, even though she can't hear you, she can see you laugh. So Deb, take it away. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> okay. A few weeks back, I was at my local grocery store stocking up on essentials. A few bananas, cereal, a two liter of tequila, you know, the basics. Then, some crazy maskless Karen came whizzing around the frozen fish, slamming straight into my cart. I was about to throw some hands, but was caught off guard by the huge pile of meat spilling out from her cart. So, here's the beef. According to The Guardian of this past April, meat shells were bare as people snatched all they could during the COVID panic. But, the real issue was behind the scenes. Several meat processors shut down due to these outbreaks, but when the chopping block is closed, the animals still die and the meat goes completely wasted. According to that same article, nearly 2 million pounds were thrown away. And that's from just one outbreak. That's how good our meat industry is. It's packing meat and there's so more for later. Feeling compelled by this newfound information, I set out to slice open the problems of our massively effective meat industry, chop up some of the causes, and then finally, toss out some solutions. Because when the meat industry fails, we all fail. And I can't fail one more time this year. I just can't. <laughs> the problem spilling out of that Karen's car and into May point one is the massive waste in our meat industry and lost security for the workers. 
When slaughterhouses and meatpacking plants shut down for any reason, that is only one link in the production chain, and it's towards the end of the line. There are still large farms with animals in all stages of growth, getting bigger by the day. So the farmers have no choice but to kill them. Move over, American murder documentary. There's a new daddy in town, and his name is Old MacDonald. <laughs> Detroit News in May of this year shares that in the pig capital of the U.S., Iowa, one farmer had to dispose of 600,000 hogs over six weeks, which is a lot. I mean, we've been trying to get rid of the biggest pig in America, and it took us four years. In the second quarter of this year alone, 7 million animals were slaughtered or culled, which is definitely the word we should adopt in our lingo. Carol Baskin, culled her husband, whacked him. But it's not just how many were killed, but how. Farms aren't equipped for these mass executions, so they just have to get creative. Michael Corky of the New York Times in May reports of one farmer who sealed the cracks in the barn and then piped in toxic gas. Another resorted to a scene best shown in the movie Fargo. You know, that one scene? Ah, yes, that one with the wood chipper. Uh, that, 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 that's all, folks. When people are going hungry all over the country, we really shouldn't putting, be putting meat out to the pasture. The second part of this problem is the impact on meatpacking plants and their workers. When factories are basically huge refrigerators with recirculating air, they become fun playgrounds for our little virus. You know, it's Corona time. As of June, there have been an estimated number of 25,000 meatpacking workers who have contracted COVID-19. And with all these people out of work, more plants start to close. As we've already reviewed, closing plants means farmers can't send their livestock out. This means a loss of upwards $1.5 million for Mr. McDonald. Not only does this affect the workforce in the meat industry, but it also rubs the consumers the wrong way. Since the meat industry is taking some time to detox and do some self-care as she should, right, queen? Grocery stores and outlets start upping the price to make profit. According to Business Insider, there has easily been a 4.3% increase in meat prices. Luckily, I'm vegetarian. So the only overpriced meat I'm buying is Mr. Aquaman over here, you know, Jason Momoa. Yeah. So now that we're up to our elbows in this problem, let's chew on some of the causes. The cause is a lot like my bladder. It's just way too efficient. For the animals, it comes down to our industry being way too efficient with way too big of numbers. Imagine that I love Lucy chocolate factory scene. Lucy and Ethel are trying to keep up with all the chocolate coming down the line, but it's just way too fast. They shove it in their shirts and their mouths everywhere. But in this case, it's animal carcasses. I know. Business Insider this past June emphasizes how the industry is all about getting as many animals through the process as quickly as possible. And we're like really, really good at it. The U.S. has a processing capacity of about 500,000 pigs for, per day. So say that only half the plants shut down, that's a quarter million pigs left on the farm. What about four or five days of that? That's, I don't know. I take math on Zoom now but I know it's a lot. <laughs> Add to that the logistics of the factories themselves. Pigs sent to market need to weigh about 280 pounds. If they go much over that, they literally cannot fit into the machinery used for processing, which if you've ever sat in a smart car or ordered pants from that Sheen website, you know exactly how that feels. So there is a small window between when they are at weight and when they need to be sent down the line. Beef analyst and future heart attack victim, Cassandra Fish, shares with the New York Times in April that for how busy these plants are, there really aren't many of them. For cattle, there are only 50 in the U.S., which highlights the main cause for this and the presidential debate. There's no pause button. Any shutdown means huge ripple effects by way of lost animals. But as noted before, these places are packed with workers, tight spaces, limited airflow. But then again, if you spread out people and make factories larger, you lose productivity and then prices skyrocket. Unlike our administration's response to coronavirus, 
we don't have to choose between money and people's lives. I'm about to serve you up a steamy plate of solutions. Our meat industry is built like the Titanic and our banks. Too big to fail, but somehow always underwater. So let's see what we have behind door number one. For the low cost of a few cents more for your pork chops, you can buy meat from a smaller local farm rather than a mass gas happy factory farm. Anya Fernald, co-founder of a sustainable farm in the Bay Area, Bel Campo, notes that small farms like hers aren't reliant on the larger meat infrastructure, so they don't have to assume the same timelines and risks. When it comes to meat, small farms have more flexibility with sizes and wait times. Even with COVID, they began social distancing before the CDC required it. Some small farms have even dumped, jumped on the digital COVID train and created apps for customers to purchase and have orders delivered. And people clearly want this. One delivery service went from 3K to 20K in orders in just one month. And that's before including their cash from their OnlyFans, you know? Look for local farms in your area doing the same. You can also check the CSA or Community Supported Agriculture page at usda.gov to view their local food directories. Or don't eat me. I know, I know, you already know that. But for real, real talk. I know you're not going to stop eating meat, even though you should. So at least eat better meat, you know, from small farms that won't waste hundreds of thousands of animals anytime they get held up. It's a small but real thing that you can actually do. Do something. So today, we've chomped our way through the problems, causes, and some solutions to the overgrown meat industri industry and how it is incredibly efficient until it's not. Like any good meal or interaction with Mark Zuckerberg, I hope this leaves you not hungry. When I do my grocery shopping, I'll be sure to think of, this, of these lessons. I'll only get the essentials and leave mass factory produced meat behind. But of course, when it comes down to my Cuervo, be a good little bank and stay in your lane. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. So thank you everybody for joining us here in our performance showcase for CMST 12 Forensics. Uh, I'm their coach, Shannon Troxel Andreas. And so um, again, if you're interested in joining speech and debate and all these wonderful, for, wonderful performers, uh, all you have to do is enroll in CMST 12. If you're interested in oral interpretation and you're not quite ready to join the team, then you can also join CMST 6, which is a fantastic opportunity to take that stepping stone uh, and go into something a little bit risky, a little bit different. So again, there's no need for you to have any experience before joining the team. All you really need is the desire to try. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, if you're here for extra credit, be sure to message your teacher or look for a response from them and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.